Welcome to Boating Tips Live with Marine Max, your weekly chat about boating products, service, safety, advice, and a whole lot more. Join the fun by submitting your boating questions answered on air by our knowledgeable captains. Without further ado, let's start the show. Are you up? Hey, man. Woo. Man, that was something, huh? Woo. <laughs> man, that was I got cool. our own intro bumper now. Man, I I didn't know we had a hype, man. It feels like I uh it feels like I'm playing for for the Tampa Bay Bucks. I'm getting ready to run out of the tunnel with Tom Brady there. Yeah, man. I'm well, stoked. <laughs> well, that's what it's all about. Well, I'm Captain Nick with Marine Max in St. Pete, and this is Boating Tips Live. And to my, well, I guess it would be my right, your left, we've got Captain Keith Lake, Marine Max Clearwater. How's it going, Captain Keith? Great, Cap Nick. How are you? Doing good. Doing good. Uh, got, got the Mondays, had two days in a row off this weekend, which is something that we usually don't see in the boating industry. So uh, getting a flywheel turning again today. Yeah, nice little Easter break. So yeah, a lot of boaters out on the water this this weekend. Oh, absolutely, and there's only going to be more and more. So, once again, guys, this is Captain. There, this is Boating Tips Live, and basically by Boating Tips Live, this is a live Q and A, and you guys can bring any boating questions to the table right there in the comments, and and we look forward to getting them all answered. So today we're going to be talking about boating with family. I mean that you know is a big driver. A lot of reasons that people get into boating, especially with the COVID pandemic over the past year, it's it one of, if not the only thing that you can do with your family that looks identical to as it did, you know, one or two years ago. And to join us and kind of hit on that a little bit more is a big time family guy, big time boater, big time boating family. That's uh, Skip Pillsbury from Marine Max Houston. So how's it going, Skip? Yep, we may have some technical difficulties, Nick. What are you gonna do, live TV, right, Keith? I think. Yep. So, we we get our we get our good intro music going. Now we just gotta still fine tune some things. Yeah. Well, it looks like you're hey, looks like you're it's stuck not the with, end of the world. Looks like you're stuck with me, mano y mano again. Yep. We'll see what see what we can do. Well, cool. Hey. Uh, so, uh, Captain Paul Gage joined us. I see that on there. He's checking in from the Bahamas. Oh, Green Max nice. vacations down there, man. What's it like down there, Paul? Give us a report. So Brian Draps on here too on the Facebook side. We got like twenty people on here checking in oh, so nice. far. Cool. Yeah. Well, while we have people starting to join, I know that every single week we sign off and we say, "Hey, drop some questions," and we'll turn around to them and and we actually do that. Believe it or not, and. And we've actually got a question here, a great question, from last week when we hit on the, the new boating law with the lanyards, the kill switches being mandatory now, at least on boats under 26 feet. Uh, hey, we got Skip back. Yep, sorry and, about that. Uh, ah, it's all good. There we go. So I guess real quick, Keith, you want to get to that question from last week before we dive on in? Yeah, so as of April 1st, New federal law took effect that on boats 20, under 26 feet, you've got to wear your emergency shutoff lanyard, your kill lanyard. And somebody had asked us if it, if the boat was manufactured prior to the switch being installed on the boat, do they have to go and install one? No, you don't, from what I've read. Um, if your boat was manufactured without one, you don't have to go and retrofit it. But there's all different kinds of... Uh, companies out there now that that make it easy to do that it's a great safety feature um so just kind of on your personal you know boating style and what you're doing you might want to uh you know go ahead and have a an, uh, kill switch installed makes sense yeah, for sure you there yeah makes sense did you uh so keith from i mean i know that you're in tune a lot with the you know CETO and you know us coast guard and stuff like that do you know if they're as as far as enforcing it do you know if they're easing into this with a lot of warnings or are they coming at it pretty hot and heavy from what you've heard i, I don't know i haven't talked to anybody that's been stopped um 
but it's going to be pretty obvious enough. They come up to you, you're scrambling around and trying to hook it to yourself and, and, uh, and all that, you know, it's not like, like you're driving down the road, trying to throw a beer can out the window or something like that. You know, you're not going to, you know, don't be doing that. You know, if you get busted without it, you know, say, yeah, it's right here. And I'm, I'm sure there's, they're going to be lenient at first, uh, yeah. just to, to, you know, they're out to educate. You know, they're not out there to bust chops and, and make it tough on us. You know, when they do a safety inspection and they're checking your life jackets and your throw cushion and your flares and your whistle and all that stuff, you know, they're not out there to be bad guys. You know, they want to, they want to go home at the end of the day too, after having a nice day on the water and not have to be fishing a dead body out or, or something like that, where it's a hundred percent totally preventable. And, and that's all this is with this emergency, with the kill lanyard. You know, it's going it, to tell me about, I mean, will it or will it not save a life? If you've got that hook to yourself, something happens, you go overboard and it shuts that motor. I, I personally know people that mm -hmm. it's been, have been affected by it that have died. You mm -hmm. know, you, you fall over, you grab the wheel as you're going over, you crank that wheel all the way left and then it just starts doing tighter and tighter circles and you can't get out of the way. If that kill switch would have been hooked up, they'd still be here today. So, um, yeah. if you've got them, if you got them, use them. It's very, it's, my deliveries. I've been doing that. You know, we get on the boat, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. They hook it up. They just, you know, they're taking it, they're hooking it around their ankle, you know, around the wrist, around your belt loop, whatever. It's, it's very easy. It's very simple. And, uh, you know, you should do it. Yeah, All right. I'm right. off my soapbox. <laughs> it might, it might <laughs> save your life. I mean, anybody that's been in the industry long enough, it probably knows some some story, some horror story somewhere along the way that could have prevented tragedy just by doing it. But yep. um, with that being said, on a uh, lighter note, Skip, looks like we got you loud and clear here. So I get we gave you the the introduction of a lifetime there, and, uh, well, and then you cut that. out on us. So so welcome <laughs> back. Yeah, sorry, I missed it. So, so, Skip, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and you know, how you grew up in the world of boats. Obviously, a big, huge boating family. And and basically where it took you along the way. Yeah, so we've uh, very fortunate to been able to uh, grow up in this business. Um, third generation. My dad and my brother both work for Marine Max, too. So, you know, we're kind of we're, we're lifers for sure. Um, and Sea Ray kind of always has been the, the core, you know, growing up as uh, in a Sea Ray dealership in Dallas. And I mean, we had dogs named Sea Ray and, you know, kind of, you know, all in 100 percent. But I've been, you know, with Marine Max now right around 18 years and uh, started out as a delivery captain and, uh, you know, just kind of working, working way up, uh, you know, through through Marine Max. Good stuff. So, so you're over there in Texas and we talk about Florida boating a lot here, Skip, in our, you know, arguably or the, the boating capital of the world, you know, there's a ton of boats on the water. There's more boats on the water than there's ever been before. A lot of new boaters. Sure. What's it look like in Texas? I mean, I don't even know. I don't even know what to think when I think of being on a water in Texas. I mean, what are you, are you, are you guys riding around uh, bulls in the water and, and, in lassoing i don't know i mean what does it look like over there well the biggest thing is you know we we've got these special flotation devices for cow for cowboy hats and you know, that kind of <laughs> stuff. and then uh you know all the the flippers come with spurs on them nice it's, uh, you know, a little different than what you guys do in florida but uh the the boating the recreation out here has been huge a lot of like same for you guys uh yeah you know we've got a ton of new boaters out on the water you know record year for us and and um, you know i mean it's great seeing you know people and their families and you know with the social distancing and you know learning how to boat and fish and you know really enjoy you know what you have right in your backyard hey what's it that freeze you guys had how how have you guys bounced back from that? I mean, we've seen you know we've seen all the news articles. And I mean, the thousands of turtles that were were saved and and stuff. I'm sure. I mean, we had a bad freeze here years ago. And we had a massive fish kill. Um, have you guys seen any anything like that? Or how how are you? How's it bouncing back? It's it's coming back pretty strong. So a lot of that that hard for her, the the fish kill was a little bit farther south from us. Believe it or not, you know. I mean, it was it was three days. I mean, just cold 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 
um, you know, no power, no heat. And, um, you know, it's real shallow water as you get farther south. Um, you know, so it, it was an impact on, on the fish. And then, you know, you see the, the turtles on the news and, you know, you get all these volunteers coming out when it's freezing out, you know, trying to save all the turtles and, you know, do what they can for the wildlife. Right. Now that was, uh, that was definitely pretty catastrophic. I mean, I guess that we could, we could experience relatively the same thing here in Florida. If we saw a freeze like that too, I mean. We have technically well, not, yeah. not to we, that extent, though. The we fish, did before. We yeah. did before your time here. I think, man, we had. Oh, really? We're on the water here, right? Out back in the slips, it was actually frozen over. There was a sheet of ice over. No there. way! Well, I That's swear, crazy. I'm telling you, there was a sheet of ice over the over the. We could slide dock lines from dock to dock across the top. <laughs> Spade fish, angel fish, captured lady fish were like suspended in the in the ice. It was the craziest thing you've ever seen. It was it was bizarre. Sounds like a dream. It was it was unreal. Yeah. It was crazy. Whoa. Brackish water froze here. I mean, we're you know, we're on Tampa Bay, but I got Allen's Creek coming out of here, so it's it's yeah. a mix. But it, yeah, it for so sure was frozen. Up here. Yeah, it looked uh, it looked pretty bad there on the news, and everybody that we talked to from Texas says, you know, yeah, it was it was that difficult. Yeah, it was, but you know, it it slowed people down a little bit. But I mean, this weekend the lake was packed. You know, out here in Clear Lake, people out, you know, boating. And yesterday it was eighty degrees, and you know, so people are getting out using their boats and you know fishing and you know just really taking it all in. Great. Hey, you want to start uh, rolling through some of these questions? Well, we still got some, you know, people before they drop off. Uh, we got Mike Gold on. Uh, he's on uh, your side over there, Nick. He's on the YouTube part. He goes, I've yeah. always, had a, always had a boat on a lake. I'll now be buying a boat for Coastal Waterway in North Carolina. What do I need to know can be the difference in partially salt water? So I guess it's going to be in salt and fresh. So um, my... My take on that is just make sure you flush the engine out. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to, if you've got a, a Verado outboard, or I don't know if you got an outboard or a stern drive or, or what, but, but uh, make sure as soon as you get back from boating, hook the freshwater hose up, flush that thing out. That's going to displace the salt water with fresh water from your hose. Um, and then your services. Make sure you you get them done. You know it's at a hundred hours or annually, whichever comes first, and uh, we keep that keep that boat running for for years to go. So he yeah, actually for, comes yeah. he comes back in later on. Let's see, he asks another question down here. Nick said, "What are the advantages and disadvantages of inboard slash outboard versus outboard engines? So IO versus outboards. So you you want to go on a thirty to thirty eight foot boat? Why don't you go ahead and roll with that? Yeah, for sure. I mean. It's even funny that five years ago, if he were, or even 10 years ago, if he were to be asking this question, we'd say, well, 30 to 38 foot. I mean, that's going to be an inboard boat. I mean, especially in the cruiser class models, you know, but how many cabin cruisers are you seeing nowadays in that 30 to 40 foot range that are outboard powered too? So neat thing is a lot of these boats, you might even see the options for inboards or outboards on them. Now, like for instance, say, you know, I think a lot of those formulas or the big sea rays and stuff like that, you'll see like you, there's 400 SLX outboards, 400 SLX inboards. What is the advantages of both? I'm an outboard guy. I've always been an outboard guy. I think that uh, I think that the maintenance schedule on them and just everything about them in the salt water, there's no there's no manifolds and risers need to be replaced. Plus in the sandbars over here, you can trim them out of the water if you have to. I always gravitate towards outboards. But, however, I do get it. You know, a lot of guys and girls are, you know, they like that space on the back of a boat. And, you know, there's just a few different maintenance items that you're going to need to be aware of on an inboard boat. And definitely, like he said in, in the beginning, never forget to flush those engines in salt water. There's one of the biggest differences between salt water and fresh water is salt water is far less forgiving. I mean, how many, I mean, how long can you leave a boat? in a freshwater lake without bottom paint and not really do any damage. Do you know? Cause I, I mean, I don't know. I'm not a lake guy. Yeah. So I was, I was reading another question. I think he asked about bottom painting on freshwater. 
Well, I mean, I was just talking about the differences between inboard or outboard to Mike, you know, just uh, right. and and stuff like that, and just about how the salt water is a lot less forgiving every step along well, the way. Well, yeah, but it, the salt water, it's I kind of liken it to this. It's like if you don't flush it out, the the water's going to evaporate. Mm -hmm. The salt's going to stay in the engine in the in the water lines, and then over time, you know, salt's one corrosive. But it also starts building up, kind of like think of like plaque in an artery. Mm -hmm. So it's going to start choking off those water passages, and then it's not going to be running as cool. And then you're going to run into other problems as it goes along. So that's why it's you know it's real important to to you know flush them out, preferably while the engine's still warm, the thermostats are open, and all that stuff. So you're getting all that that stuff flushed out of there too. Um, some people ask you, can I add like Dawn dish soap to it or or uh, stuff like that. I wouldn't recommend. I'd, it's not in the owner's manual, so I'm not going to recommend that. I'm going to say no. I know a lot of people use salt away, mm -hmm. um, washing their boats and flushing them out and stuff like that. So um, it just it just helps keep those passages a little cleaner. But you know, make sure you you flush it out. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's going to come. A lot of it's going to come down to preference, Mike. But I mean, if you're talking salt water, to go back to your first question, it it is it is a different ball game. It it really is. You see boats differently. You see them built to withstand different stuff. And I, you know, you know, one of the things that I'm going to check myself here a little bit, Keith. And I know that you're probably pretty well versed in this. I always have said outboard's the only way to go. Only way to go. No exceptions. So I had a custom 280 SLX here. Uh, that delivered finally last week and I took it out and that boat was actually pretty sweet, man. It, it, it was a pretty sweet, a 280 SLX inboard. Yep. I, I know you yeah, might yeah. have a little bit more. You've probably done a few deliveries on them. Yeah. Dual prop and everything. Yeah. No, the IOs are great. I mean, with an outboard, you're going to gain more storage space too, because that compartment is now empty. So you can, yeah. you can put stuff down in there and all that stuff. Um, but you know, Pat O'Brien's checking in from, you know, over there in Texas, he's talking about Lake Sam Rayburn. You know, 800 miles of shoreline. That's all fresh water. I mean, some guy, you know, I guarantee you go over there. There's a bunch of sea race stern drives over there. Or you're talking about formulas or, or you know, the Bajas and the go fast and the cigarettes yeah. and, and all that stuff. The performance type boats. Um, fresh water, you know, absolutely. Um, it's just the, the longevity of it. Once you get over to the saltwater side is your probably going to be better off with an outboard until you get up into a bigger vessel where you can go totally straight inboard as opposed to IO, which is inboard outboard and people listening. So an inboard outboard boat is where your engine is actually inside the boat and then mounted on the transom. You've got a transom plate and then the gear housing and the propeller then are obviously on the outside. So it's your, your engines inside your props on the outside, as opposed to an outboard boat that the whole thing's just mounted on a transom on the outside. Then we get into the bigger stuff where you go into straight inboards or pod boats to where those are typically diesel and they're bigger and you can't really flush those out, but they don't typically come out of the water. So the water's not draining out of those passages and it stays in there in liquid form and it's not corroding away you know, as bad as what would happen when air gets to it, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Hey, how familiar are you with, uh, with a lot of these Aviaras, you know, we sell a lot of them with outboards. Have you delivered any or spent any time on any of the inboard Aviaras? Yeah. Yep. Stern. Yeah. The IO, the Stern drive. Yes. So, so tell me about those Ilmore inboards. They're supposed to be pretty top notch as far as having a different system i mean I, I don't know anything about them besides the basic sales presentation that i went through um tell me about those ilmores yeah i mean i've the same presentation and stuff i've been you know through with you but um they're beefed up it's got a different type like closed cooling system yeah in it and it's uh, i don't want to quote it but i think it's the the warranty period on it is is pretty lengthy yeah um and uh you know, there it's Ilmore comes from the, you know, the racing side of, of, uh, the thing. So, I mean, those guys, you know, they got their, they got their game together and, uh, it's a, it's a great product. Great run of boat with stern drives. Yeah. I haven't ran one yet. I've ran plenty of outboard of yours, but, um, definitely 
curious. I mean, I think it's it, it's such an outboard market down here, isn't it, man? Just yep. just just period. I mean, everybody is opting for outboards. You know, you might go up north and and it's not going to be quite as quite as outboard dominant or whatever it may be but it's uh it's funny looking at the pictures it, it really is from like a, a grand lake store or even a store here maybe five or ten years ago and and just seeing all stern drives in a lot and now it's all outboards yeah and, i mean it's not better or worse it's just different you know time change technology changes and and uh i mean shoot how how, how long have you seen it over 18 19 years yeah that's when i started here there weren't <laughs> There weren't any outboards in the showroom, I don't think. It was all it was all maybe drives, an op- you know. Maybe an Optimax here and there. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's. Uh, all right. Let's 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 go into this one over here. We got some good questions. Hey guys, looks like Keith and I are riding solo again. Skip, we want to thank you for your time. Maybe we'll have yep. you back on a separate episode. Um, technology. It is the. It is the best, and you can't live with it, can't live without it. But uh, we'll we'll have to do a rain check on the Skip Pillsbury episode. So it looks like Keith and I are just shooting from the hip again. So that means that we need your questions to stay afloat. So yep, drop, load us drop up. them down there. So go ahead and try us. If you if you can't stump Keith, then you might be able to stump me. So drop them in there. Looks like we got some good questions pouring in there, Keith. We got Brian Drap. Brian, thanks for watching. We missed you last week. Sorry you didn't get the notification, but we're happy to have you back here today. Brian says, where are the best beaches to take kids versus where are the best college age type party coves? Well, I'm, I'm a little old for that. Keith, why don't you answer that one? I want to know where they're partying nowadays. You're, you're, <laughs> you're a little old for that. Well, uh, <laughs> we can go to, we can go to PK out here. You can go to passage key, Egmont and Maria, <laughs> stuff like that. Yeah. You know, so, uh, that's on the, that's on the adult scope yeah uh, and then uh i mean it, it, you know around here it's it's not it's pretty much all equal you know i mean everybody kind of you know sticks to themselves and they do they'll do what they want and nobody gets you know crazy and and uh and all that hey have you ever actually been out to beer can island yeah I, you know, I've never been, I've, I've only driven past it. I mean, I've spent a good amount of time at Egmont, a good amount of time at three broker and Clue key. I've never actually been to beer cane Island and I definitely, you know, want to know your input on after it got bought out and it got a little bit more regulated. Do you think it was a good thing or what? I don't, I've been out there with customers practicing like stern anchoring and docking. I haven't been out there on a weekend. I've been by there. Um, I'm just, I mean, straight up, man. I, I like the clean, clear, crystal water. So I'd rather run another 20 miles underneath the Skyway, get out to Egmont, Passage Key, Anna Maria, and all that. But I guess, you know, if you want to go to a little beach and you're up in Tampa Bay and you don't have the time to, to run that far, you know, it's fine. You got to be careful, though, too, because it's the ship channel runs right along there. Yeah. And if you end up on the, be the west side of the island, and a freighter goes by and it's going by in the deep water and it throws a bigger wake than what you you pretty much think it does or would would expect it to but then as it comes up on that shoal and it comes out of that deep water and all of a sudden it gets up on the water that's four or five foot deep and then into three foot where you're at those waves start cresting and rolling and and all that so you got to be careful that you don't get your you know your boat swamped or you know, turned around or flipped over or filled up with water. So that's why the deeper little part is back there around on the east side where they, uh, I don't know, they know they built that, the, the, the platform up and all that stuff. Then I heard it was back out of commission and then it's back in. So I don't, I'm not sure what's going on with it. Dude, speaking of those freighters, I remember I used to wait at McDill Air Force Base with one of my old wrestling coaches and, and when the big, big freighters would come in, when you'd be fishing on a golf course side of it, which is pretty much looking towards the, uh, the what's it called, the landfills, that that whole area, mm-hmm. you'd see the ships would come through. And those ships are so big, you they literally would pull their own tides almost. Like when those big, big, big ones come through really close, like it would literally move the water from where you're standing out and then back in. Yep. Pretty crazy. On well, another note, yeah, you know, like kink, kink fishing and tarpon fishing and all that stuff, you know, out there and along the ditch, we call it the ditch. 
the Egmont Ship Channel. And, you know, tarpon fishing, the great spots right there off of Egmont. I mean, there's actually right here, right off the beach, right off the tip end of Egmont in Tampa Bay, there's a 90 foot deep hole. Um, but in the way the current moves through there and the bait gets sucked out and all that stuff. But, you know, you know, the pecking order, right? You know, so as those vessels that are constrained by draft, restricted in their ability to maneuver and all that stuff, you know, you got to stay out of their way. Don't be hooked up right on the edge of the channel or, or, or flirting around with any of that stuff. I mean, if you're there and you can't get your engine started to get out of the way there, they can't stop. No. So. And they move a lot faster than they look. Yep. yep. How fast do they move? 14, 15 knots. And it looks like they're just crawling. Oh, every bit water. of that. Yeah. 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 It looks like they're crawling, but it's like, I guess it's like a jet you see getting ready to land or take off at, yeah. at an airport. You think, how's that thing staying up in the air? Right. You know, it's just barely creeping along, but it's, it's, it's hauling the mail, man. Dude, you know, my favorite place to boat on the whole West coast of Florida. If I, if I had to, I don't want to say live anywhere, but if I had one day left to live and it had to be spent on a sandbar somewhere, you know what it would be? Where? Jewfish Key. I love that area, man. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's some of the cleanest water with the exception of the Keys on the whole coast. I mean, I guess you can make the same argument for, for Passage Key. Passage Key, I'd throw right in there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I love Passage that area. Key is so cool. If you're into to fly fishing and you're a tarpon guy you get out there early in the morning for anybody's been out around there and you post up right there and you see those fish come through and pairs and singles and little groups and then if you get them daisy chaining around and you flip that fly out there i mean you can watch it come up suck it in you set the hook and then that fish has got nowhere to go except up you know i mean they just start you know jumping and taking off and it's beautiful there you yeah, go. Brandon, I, Brandon Jones agrees with you down there on Jewfish. It is beautiful. Uh, yeah, you know? I love it there. And, and plus, run I mean, over to that whole area down there, Keith, like let, like just the dynamic of it. Like you're yeah. right there to Longboat Pass to go out in the ocean. You got Mar, Mar Vista and that other restaurant right there. Yep. You can shoot right into Sarasota Bay. And I love I love running like a big Aquila or big a big whatever through that little channel there on the inside and, and you've got land on both sides of you and it's a very unforgiving channel but it is so crystal clear you can just see everything there yep it's it's absolutely beautiful i you know the further south you get well that's that's not true either because once you kind of get north it gets really clear again i mean i've run boats i remember like one of the first times i picked a boat up from oh gosh where was i taking it out of Hudson or somewhere and I'm coming down or I'm taking it up or bringing it back. Or maybe I was even running up to crystal river and I'm out off Arapika or somewhere and I'm looking down and it's like, Holy crap. I'm going to run aground. I'm, you know, I'm looking at the depth finder and I'm in, you know, 12, 15 feet of water, but it's, I mean, you could see everything just you yeah. know, like looking through, like looking through air, you know? So, but, uh, you get North, you get south, it gets really, really pretty. Oh, I love riding through the, uh, what is it, the Northwest Channel there out of Key West, and it's just like oh yeah, a deep channel, clean water, clear water, and on both sides, you can just see everything going on. And, and don't get caught slipping because you'll pay for it. Yep. And uh, But it, it, I think it definitely makes it a little easier when you've got such sh such good viz and that that's what they say about the bbis i've never been down there but they say that down in the bbis you can pretty much see wherever you're going and if you run down if you run aground there then you probably you know just aren't paying attention <laughs> you could you, you could see pretty much everything around you yeah you're you're driving around between volcano tops you know it's yeah it's, it's, it's straight deep drop-offs yeah um Pat O'Brien talking about Sam Rayburn and the all that shoreline and everything. So the other day I talked about one of my favorite fishing shows was Northwoods Law, but then there's also its sidekick, which is Lone Star Law, which uh, they've got on like marathons of them now. But uh, they're out on Sam Rayburn, you know, quite a bit running around in their Dude. boats and stuff. There, it's pretty cool. Eight hundred ninety miles. Yeah, it's a big how, old how, dammed up reservoir. How much do we have in the St. Pete Tampa area? Oh gosh. I think it's more than that. 
per well coastline mm. shoreline didn't mean to stomp you i don't know we can do the math i mean 60 miles over up at 180 no probably that's yeah probably about probably similar the time you go around mm. to tampa and back over to down apollo beach and down to the skyway yeah it's a lot it's a big lake yeah brian drap says asking or saying kids swimming off the back with outboard versus io with the platform kids can't get near the outdrive the out the near outdrive so near the near to the drive so stern drives yeah you know you're gonna they're gonna stay in the water but your swim ladders are typically off to either the port or starboard side so take your steering wheel turn your drives the opposite way it's going to keep the props away from the ladder right and then same thing if you've got an outboard you know you're going to do the same thing um, you don't necessarily need to pull the engines all the way up out of the water and and all that stuff so i mean you can as long as you're not going to be bouncing off the bottom with them you know leave them down but just just turn them away from whichever side that the boarding ladder is and you're gonna have plenty of clearance yeah absolutely and, and one thing that i've been watching one of our captain chris uh captain chris age here do when he's actually you know like a lot of people are so afraid of of a propeller in the water and rightfully so i mean you got to be careful you know if you got swimmers in the water you got to kind of keep that in mind and on a lot of what i do like on a lot of these smaller boats and smaller engines you can't bump that in and out of gear you know if, if you've got swimmers out in the water and you're in neutral you you can't you can't nudge that throttle and put it in and out of gear because it's got the safety switch on it and one thing that i've seen chris do a lot here at the dock is you know if he's just tying up or he's got it in idle or, or neutral i should say he'll uh put it in throttle only mode and i'm like why are you putting throttle only mode well you know in case somebody um bumps into it you're not going to put the boat up on the dock and you know if we're if we're being brutally honest right now and we're telling confessions i did i had that happen to me one time at a kingfish tournament and i looked like a big fool you know i i was in neutral to dock unloading a fish at the sun coast sun coast kingfish classic and i had one of one of the anglers on my boat you know trip and fall and, and he landed into the throttles and yeah i put the boat you know we were tied off there was no damage that were done or anything but we we dinged the rub rail a little bit caused some fiberglass work that had to be done but i mean it, it, it could absolutely happen especially when people aren't paying attention so i don't know how we got off on that tangent but just That's a great uh, point what do you think about that putting it in with these digital throttles putting it in I'll, throttle only at the dock or i'll do an orientation and i'll go through the whole boat we start up the bow or we start in a cabin or wherever yeah. we start and we go through everything then we'll get to the helm and then it's like now this right here is the most important thing you're going to learn today is this little button right here that says throttle only and and a hundred percent once you're ready to leave once you want to take control of the helm and you're ready to to em embark go ahead and hit that button and take it out of throttle only as soon as you walk away from there i don't care if like you're saying you're tied up to the dock if you're out there fishing and you're out in the wide open water and you know you got that kingfish on that's running around and you you know you're doing the running around the boat up around the bow coming under getting underneath the motors and somebody things are going on somebody's got the gaff if they it's all digital throttle and shift so it's not like you've got to take a cable and force that thing anymore so if somebody bumps those shifters the boat's going to go into gear mm. so the second you walk away step away from the helm just like what captain chris is doing down there i'll do here you hit that throttle only button mm -hmm. yeah it's not just for revving up your engine and looking nah. cool or no sense we're not, to do that on these we're, we're, we're not driving two strokes we're not giving it gas at the dock uh let's see you want to what do you think about some of these questions down here keith you want to you want to get to sure let's keep rolling here um uh chris is that same last name is that your brother yeah. no i'm no relation no oh. i'm kidding i'm kidding that's <laughs> that's that's my youngest brother so, um, so, he, I, wanted, so... I wanted to talk about this with you keith i'm not quite as educated on the matter but i'm sure that you're gonna be you're gonna be on top of this well, so 
those of you just that are listening that can't see what's going on on the, the screen here, Chris is asking us, do you, do you, do Nick and I think the Piney Point wastewater leak is going to affect St. Pete Beach? At this point, I've got to say, who knows? I mean, I don't think the the scientists know. I watched uh, a news conference today. Uh, yesterday, they had Governor DeSantis over there. Um, today, they had, um, oh gosh, I got his name, uh, the, the local congressman from over there in uh, Manatee County, Hillsborough County. Uh, it's terrible. He's a customer of ours, too. Um, he was there, but they brought in the, the EPA, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers, a bunch of stuff. So, you know, you got you got some of the, the greatest minds and scientists and, and engineers and stuff trying to trying to work on that. So so what it is, there's a phosphate plant over there in uh, Hillsborough County near the Skyway Bridge that's got, I don't know, uh, acidic water high pH or, you know, part of it may or may not be radioactive, but it's high in nitrogen, high in ammonia or um, ammonia, which could be caused for algae blooms. And apparently the, the container that's holding it all in is leaking and they're worried about it breaching the, the levee and houses have been evacuated and all that stuff. But I mean, Tampa Bay is a huge place. It just kind of sucks right now. We're on this tide cycle that we're on. Yeah. Where it's basically a two tide day and all it is is a slow incoming tide all day instead of a fast going out going tide, which would take that water out. But but uh, they're dumping millions of gallons a day right now. Today I saw they were doing 35 million gallons and hope to have it up to 100 million a day. Now, how's that um, working, but, Keith? Do they need to catch the tides right? You know, if they get a big dump or something, they can't. They did. It's 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 beyond that now. So it's just they they're trying to alleviate the pressure, drop the water level down to keep it from from busting view. Hey, thanks, Al Alzeus. It's Vern Buchanan is the congressman from from down there, and um, so and and he's pissed. You know, I was I was watching that, but we'll see. It's, it's nobody knows. Right. So I hope not. I hope it just gets in the bay and dissipates and we don't have a, any kind of algae bloom or, or anything mm -hmm. like that. But I mean, I, I can't touch that with a 10 foot pole. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, not but, to get too political too, but I was reading also about, you know, I know captains of clean water or captains for clean water has been, um, a big advocate for restoring the flow to Everglades. And I just saw you know, there, there's some movement there, you know, to restore that natural flow once again, down South. Yeah. I think they just ripped out like uh five miles yeah. of old 41 or something down there in the Everglades to get the water flowing. No, that's huge, 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 huge. Yep. Every little bit helps. Yeah. So, but uh, yeah, good, quite good question, uh, Chris. And I, I guess we'll see. So, uh, let's see, Brian here, if you could choose any city to move to with canals or dock with perfect clear water, what cities would you be looking for on a list of two to three? Okay. Move anywhere, canals and dock. I mean, I, I'm going to be a little bit biased. I, I, I truly do believe that the intercoastal system, you know, from my number one, seriously, is St. Pete Beach, right there on the beach. I mean, going all the way from Tarpon Springs down to Marco Island on the intercoastal system. I mean, there, there is so many neat communities here around St. Pete, just whether it's Treasure Island, whether it's Tierra Verde, whether it's Vina Del Mar, whether it's even, you know, I mean, there's a great community there. I'm not even going to get into the whole, you know, Snell Isle, Whedon Island thing, but I'm talking specifically to beach, all the restaurants and stuff like that. I think that you really can't beat St. Pete Beach. That's my number one. Great question, Brian. My number two, if, I mean, I'll, I'll flat out say it. If, if, if money wasn't an option or it wasn't an issue, I mean, man, I love, I love Naples. That is, that is one of my favorite favorite places i mean you you see some of those properties down there when you're going to what is it gordon's pass down there i mean yep. that is some some of the most beautiful real estate on the world some of the most beautiful boats in the world and and i love it down there so that's my number two for number three canals i'm gonna have to go 
I'm going to throw a curveball at you here. I mean, I, I, I do. I like Jacksonville too. I mean, I think that Jacksonville is so cool with, you know, you get, you get such a mix of like marsh and stuff up there. And I think that it's like, it's like just where you start to transition out of that Florida feel and you start to, you know, almost feel like you're in, you know, Savannah or Charleston or, or up along that way. And I'm going to throw a fourth one in there too. The Florida panhandle is second to none. We, we, we spend so much time talking about how clear the water is to further South you get and how awesome it is. You get today keys and Northwest channel. But I, I mean, I, I think that the water up in Destin and, and Panama city beach gives it a run for its money, especially with the white sand. Now that is a cool boating community up there. And we've got a ton of stores up there and do a lot of business up in the Florida panhandle. You know, I'd actually, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to pull a switch here. I'm going to bump that up to number two. So, St. Pete Beach, Florida Panhandle, Naples, and uh, Jacksonville for my four. So I guess I'm pretty biased, stuck on Florida. What about you, Keith? So that's why they call it the Emerald Coast, right? I mean, yeah. it is it is beautiful up there. So I'm just going to give you two. So my number one, I 100% agree with you. South Pinellas County is, mm -hmm. I, I absolutely love it. As far as boating communities, you got four ways to go. You can go up into Tampa Bay. You can blast offshore, north up the intercoastal, up to Tarpon Springs, go south all the way down to Fort Myers. It's just, it's it's laid out perfect. The, 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 the water, the beaches, all that stuff is perfect. My second place would be a little island called Summerland Key down in the Keys. It's about 26 miles or so north of Key West, I guess. Um, cool is thing that, about is that where there's an air, is there an airstrip there? Yeah, yeah, dude. So these houses are right on the water. So you got your house, you walk out your backyard, you step onto your dock, you step onto your boat. Your front yard is an airstrip. There's a runway there, and so. People, I mean, you're down there, you say you work in Miami or, you know, Naples or wherever. I mean, you can commute, hop in your plane, fly up to work, come back down, or if that's your weekend house, whatever, you come, you land down there on your little airstrip, you turn around, you taxi back, you pull it up in front of your house, you tie her down, you walk into the backyard, you hop on your boat and go. And it's just, I love it. It's close to Key West, but it's still far enough away. You're right between Kemp Channel runs between Summerlin and Cudjo. So you want to run back to the backside out to Content Keys and go lobster in and all you go by the the spy balloon that you know monitors all the the traffic and stuff over Cuba and in the straits and all that stuff. They got a the big it's it's a it's a it's a it's on a tether and it's a surveillance helium not helium, but it's a surveillance balloon that they crank way up and they can watch what's going on all down in the straits and, and all that stuff. But, um, that's pretty cool. I never yeah. knew about that. Yeah. It's, it's a cool place down there. Summerlin key. I love it. I rented houses down there before we've been down there for lobster. And so yeah. you, you, you pull up, you got your boat right there in the, on the seawall. It's an easy run out to the Atlantic straight out, or you can go back up into the Gulf Florida Bay. Man, that's a good question, Brian. I, we need more thought-provoking questions like that. That was good. <laughs> good, good on you. That that one got the wheels turning a little bit. Usually, we're the ones asking those questions. So good, good on you, Brian. Uh, let's see, man. It's already three forty-five. That means we got time for a good, uh, two good uh, mean potatoes questions. So uh, we got Lisa Love nine thousand there from YouTube. Not many YouTube questions today. Uh, actually, there's a good little that's... mix. I take that back. Uh, other than the obvious life jackets, etc., what insider tips you have for people when boating with kids? Uh, well, I'm going to go ahead and say the one biggest one that people forget is definitely, and this should always go with that saying, and, and I don't mean to sound cliche, but the whole designated driver thing is, is I think, even more important because, you know, you don't want to, you know, endanger, you know, any of your kids' lives or anything, but, you know, that's going to become more and more apparent as we make our way into summertime, especially here in Florida, as people are, you know, that that sun's beating down on you. You got kids on the boat, two or three beers at the bar and the air conditioning is a lot different than two or three beers on the boat when it's 90 degrees out. 
and, and you're dehydrating yourself. So, so definitely I'd say my number one tip for that Lisa is going to be, you know, keep a designated driver standby. Keith, what are, what are some, what are some go-tos for you? It's a great tip. Um, keep the kids hydrated, Yeah, you know, keep them sunscreen hydrated, keep them in a the shade. If you can keep them awake, I mean, man, a lot of times I get these little kids out on the boats and we're doing a delivery and you look around, and, <laughs> you know, they're zonked, you know, I mean, no matter what, you know, as soon as they get on a boat, you know, it's just, they're out. Um, and the other thing is if you're, if you're taking them fishing or you're doing something, keep them active, you know, don't go out there and, you know, if you're going to go and you're trolling for that smoker kingfish, and you got, you know, big baits and, you know, you're the only fish you're going to catch is going to be a 40 pounder plus, you know, if you got kids go out there and chum up and catch a bunch of little Spanish mackerel or, mm. or get some shrimp and go out on the flats and keep them busy, keep them active at least for an hour or two till they get you know, tired. I mean, catch them, take them out, let them catch pinfish, let them catch all your grouper bait, you know, just, just keep them engaged and keep them, keep them going. Don't let them get bored. You know, so they're looking forward to going out on the boat with you the next time, right? I'm going fishing with grandpa because, you know, Allie knows she's going to go out and she's going to go catch fish, you know, not, oh, well, we're going to go out and sit around in the hot sun all day. Oh man, I used to see it all the time in the charter industry. I mean, th those little fish that you're catching and you're banning the rod that, that might bore you to death and isn't going to exactly excite you after doing it every day. You know, a little kid like that's not going to forget that for the rest of their lives. And you, and sometimes you need to check yourselves and, and and understand exactly how special it is and a lot of these guides around here truly do a great job with kids the question that i used to get a lot in the industry and i know a question that a lot of guides get is you know how how old does my does my kid need to be or whatever and you know and, and a lot of these guides really really do a phenomenal job of of making it fun and exciting for for the kids so you know that's another great thing to do especially as we we, we make our way into the summer here and you know you're looking for something to do if the kids might not be at camp, the kids might be at home. I know that there's a lot of great, you know, on the water fish camps that a lot of these guides are doing and, and stuff like that. And, you know, getting a, a charter guide for, you know, to get the kids involved, I think is truly second to none. You see it all the time. Yep. I agree. That's cool. So there's one in particular over here in Tampa, you know, you could go by there and they've got like little hula hoops floating. <laughs> you know, different, different, di different diameters. Oh yeah. Right. So the kids are standing on the dock and they're casting, you know, so maybe, you, you know, you cast it into the great big hoop, you know, you get a point and if you can pinpoint it down into the smaller hoops, you get more points or however they do it. But, you know, they're, I see, I see them go out of there all the time. And then like you said, the guides are fully invested in this and, you know, they'll load up, you know, three or four kids. I mean, those kids are there, they're throwing the cast net. They're tying knots. They're learning how to tie all the, you know, tie the, the hooks, the lures, all that stuff. So there's, there's a lot of good things to keep, you know, kids active and going. But, but the main thing is just keep them, keep them engaged, keep them busy. Mm -hmm. That's and, and, like, and like you said, even adults, right? Like, so I was, I made it on charter boats back in the day too. And, you know, you just had one of those days of just like, ah, just nothing's going right. You can't do, so you get over to a wreck. And, you know, somebody's down here from Ohio or Michigan or whatever. And, man, get a two bluer out or you throw a troll a blue run or somebody and you catch a barracuda. And it's like, holy smokes, look at this. I mean, look at the teeth in this thing. I mean, the fish jumps and it runs and, it, you know, you're bending a pole and you bring it up and, you know, all those gnarly teeth. But that's all that they want. You know, they just, you know, it's just, it's really cool. It's something they're going to remember, you know, Benitas, you know, whatever it is something to pull on your rod yeah um that's a good point keith there's uh looks like we got time for one question here from connor grew hello from dc Ooh, all right what is the salinity threshold for flushing the engine we store in high and dry up the river in chesapeake bay the marina insists that a flush is not necessary i'm a new boat owner so can i buy a fish tank for salinity Test kit to confirm. Uh, it's a good question. I mean, we got a lot of people that that boat on the Hillsborough River up here and and stuff like that, or maybe even up north, you know, by Crystal River, that you might keep the boat in salt water or keep the I'm sorry, keep the boat in fresh water, boat in salt water all day, come back and boat in the fresh water, 
I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Keith, but I mean, would that essentially be the same thing as flushing your engine or would you still recommend a flush at the end of the day, even if you're running it through fresh water? If it's a great idea. I mean, if he gets a salinity test kit and you can test it and you can show, Hey, I've still got salt water in this. Yeah. You know, flush it out. I mean, if the, if the Marina insists that they won't do it, maybe they can put it on a rack for you and you can do it yourself. Just a peace of mind thing. And you know, your taste buds are pretty good test taste test too. You know I mean? With, if I've got a, a boat that I got water in a bilge, you're looking at it and you're going, Hmm, this fresh water or salt water. Only one way to find out, stick your finger in there and taste it. And you know, if it's salt, then it's like, okay, I got salt water, you know, figure it out. I got salt water coming here. If it's fresh water, maybe it's from the guys washing the boat. Or maybe I got a fresh water tank that's leaking. You know, so far it's been pretty good. It's just either been fresh water or salt water. I haven't had a haven't had a head issue or anything. So so we're good. Yeah, it's who knows? You might you might be on to something there, Connor. Yep. Well, it looks like we got room for one more, Keith. We got a captain's hey captains, first time boat buyer soon, medium experience with boats, been considering a galleon brand third. 32 foot mini yacht for long weekends. That's a 325 GTO in Bahama trips. Good name brand. Yes, absolutely. I'm not just saying that because I sell them. They're, uh, I mean, they, I mean, as far as fit and finish goes, all right, I'm going to go into a little galleon tangent here. Keith can go on one too because he's delivered probably a hundred times more than I have. But, you know, as far as galleons go, the fit and finish, second to none. I mean, from, from the, the headboards to the liner to everything. It's all second to none. Galleons are 90 percent vertically integrated company, so you're going to see a lot of stuff done on a galleon, whether it's a teak, whether it's a metal work. It's going to be done in house. The reason for that is they're doing a lot of that themselves. It's going to keep these costs actually relatively low on these boats. Like you might be looking at a, a two million dollar galleon, and you might think that it's a three million dollar boat all day, even though the quality's there. That's why a lot of it's in house. So yeah, in short, yeah, great boat, Al, um, and I'm sure Keith can attest to that too absolutely i wouldn't have any issues with that galleon's awesome man they're beautiful what's the biggest galleon you've delivered what a 60 what's what's the 60 what is it 68 or something oh really yeah 680 yeah there you go i think you guys got one down there don't you we do. We just took a 640 in on trade and, and we took in a 680 and you think, okay, a 64 foot boat to a 68 foot boat. What's the difference? And the owners had the 640 on the floating dock the other day, side tied to the 680 as they moved all their stuff on. And there was a lot of differences between those two boats, man. I mean, uh, they're, they're very different boats besides just a four feet of lane that actually, believe it or not, the, the heights, the, the 640s actually got more height. And then the 680 is definitely a lot sleeker. 640 has got drop down sides and a center walkthrough. The, the 680 definitely feels like a bigger boat when you're on it, as it should. Um, so I thought that was pretty cool. I mean, yeah. to really get galleonized, we've talked about it for a while. And I know that Al's talking about the smaller ones, but you're going to see that quality there on those little galleons as you are in the 680s and 640s yep. and stuff like that. So absolutely, uh, good question, Al. All right, Nick, what do we got next week, bud? So next week, if I'm correct, we have the... It's going to be kind of the same thing we're doing today, right? With a twist. So it's going to be your boating questions answered, April boating Q&A with a special segment on channel markers by Keith. I think this is really special, Keith. So maybe the man behind the curtain can drop your videos down on the side there. Keith has a great series of boating tips videos on YouTube that cover everything from channel markers sandbar stern anchoring navigating the intercoastal and stuff like that so we're going to be specifically talking next week about the channel markers everybody knows red right return but how is that not the most confusing thing in the world when you're talking about you know well how do i know if i'm returning how do i know if i'm going and it's actually pretty simple and we're blessed to have a great intercoastal waterway system that's relatively well marked around here so so i believe that's what you're going to be diving into uh, next week yep that and whatever else anything else comes up so we rely on you guys so think about your questions you want to ask or anything that nick and i can help you out with that's what we're here to do no questions too minuscule to to dive into and uh we're looking forward to it we enjoy it but we're into season two episode who knows what 
I believe 10. How many to check on that here? Um, yeah, well, look, we're not even keeping track of it anymore, but I'm yeah, sure it's somewhere. Well, well, Keith, it's been a pleasure, man, and uh, I'll definitely see you out on the water this week one way or another. Got an exceptional week ahead of us weather-wise. I mean, you couldn't you couldn't order weather better than this. Yep. it's uh, This time of year is uh, pretty doggone nice, you know. So big transition, great for fishing, great for just boating in general, getting out there on the water. I mean, any time to get out on the water is a good time. Yeah. Well, uh, we wish everybody a happy and safe boating season, especially as our Fellow boaters up north might be unwrapping their boats and peeling that shrimp shrink wrap back and uh, get excited because this is what it's all about. Keith, thank you once again for joining me. It's always a pleasure to uh, to be alongside you. Absolutely, Nick. Look forward to seeing you next Monday, 3 o'clock. See you next Monday. Yep. See y'all. See you out on I the guess. water.